So my name is Ron Daniels. I'm one of the two moderators. I'm an intensive care doctor in the UK. I'm also the founder and chief executive of the UK Sepsis Trust and one of the vice presidents of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Good afternoon. My name is Abdelilad Hosawi. I'm uh, the other moderator. I'm a transplant and hepatobiliary surgeon by training, and I'm one of the uh, uh, Vice Presidents of the Global Sepsis Alliance, and I chair the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean Sepsis Alliance. Now, we, we send apologies from Hanan Balki, so un, uh, unlike the program, uh, Rudy has stepped in at the last minute, so I'm going to introduce Rudy Eggers, who's the Director of Integrated Health Service at the WHO, a public health specialist by background who previously spent many years as a WHO representative in Kenya. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, is the mic on? Can you hear me? Good. So, good afternoon, everybody, both in the room and, of course, everybody online. It's a great pleasure to be with you here, and I'm speaking on behalf of our Assistant Director General, Dr. Hanan Balkri, who unfortunately was unable to join uh, here. So, I'm just going to read off the statement that she's prepared. In 2017, the 17th World Health Assembly and the member states therein requested WHO to tackle the problem of sepsis through the approval of a resolution to, for the prevention, diagnosis, and clinical man management of sepsis. In 2020, in the 73rd World Health Assembly, there was a report provided detailing the significant work that had been accomplished by WHO and the partners, including training, policy development, and the support of member states on enhancing awareness of uh, infection prevention and control, WASH, and other sepsis-related topics. In the same year, WHO issued the first global report on the epidemiology and burden of sepsis, highlighting the public health impact of sepsis and proposing future directions and priorities in sepsis uh, and the epidemiological research thereof. We all know that in the last two years, the COVID-19 pandemic and abuse of antibiotics has dramatically worsened on a global scale. WHO's data indicate that 72% of patients hospitalized with COVID-19 received antibiotics, which we know do not work against SARS-CoV-2. In most cases, did not need those antibiotics. Clearly, while we have to recognize the life-saving effects of antimicrobials if used correctly, we dare not lose this effect by using antimicrobials inappropriately. Yesterday, WHO and the member states celebrated World Patient Safety Day, which this year is dedicated to medication safety. Abuse or misuse of antimicrobials is a medication safety issue because it leads to increased antimicrobial resistance, which should be seen as an adverse event or medication error associated with healthcare delivery. Furthermore, we know optimal infection prevention and control practices are the most cost-effective strategies to reduce the spread of AMR. This year, we brought the critical issue of infection prevention and control to the World Health Assembly and are now working intensively to develop a global strategy, the very first global strategy on IPC. Member states need to identify targets, goals and timelines to implement what is needed to ensure that infections do not spread in healthcare and community settings. In 2019, a total of 4.9 million estimated deaths were associated with antimicrobial resistance, and we know that 20% of all cause global deaths are due to sepsis, and many of these, of course, are a consequence of AMR infection. WHO has worked diligently in the past year to finalize a patient-centered approach to antimicrobial resistance to ensure diagnosis and prevention, as well as treatment uh, that are at the core of the global AMR response. There's still a long way for us to go. The most recent report indicates that only 20% of the 138 member states who reported 
have funded and monitored national action plans. And among those 20%, only four countries are in middle and low income countries. The time for emphasizing and acting on clear synergy between pandemic preparedness, sepsis, IPC, and AMR is now. Let's not waste it. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. Wise words. Uh, are we going to do a Q&A in between? or at the, at I, I think at the end, yeah. At the end. So <clears throat> it is my pleasure now, and, and again, just to keep you uh, awake with us after lunch, we're going to alternate between in-person and Zoom. So the next speaker is going to be on Zoom. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Keith Martin, who is the Executive Director at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health in the U.S., and he's going to talk about why sepsis needs to be in the public and political space. Well, thank you, Dr. al Hasawi. Uh, greetings from Washington, D.C., where we're about a kilometer north of the, the White House. And first, I'd like to really congratulate everybody on the 10th anniversary of World Sepsis Day and really uh, congratulate the tireless work of many people around the world to address this neglected global challenge. I'd particularly like to thank my friends, Dr. Kassoon, Professor Reinhardt, Dr. Daniels, for their leadership over the years. So the question I was asked is, as Dr. al Hasawi mentioned, is why sepsis needs to be a public and political, in the public and political space. And I'm going to take a little bit of license and add how we can actually achieve that goal. I think the genesis of the question really comes from the fact that despite the passage of the World Health Assembly Resolution 70.7 back in 2017, we have not seen the uh, implementation of what we already know will address this challenge. And we know that these are really uh, political choices at different levels, whether it's government or health authorities. And they're made within the context, of course, of many different political choices and options. So the charge to us, I think, is how do we make sepsis put sepsis at the top of the political choices that people make. And it's a, it's a challenge, of course. And scale up what we already know will save lives. So here's a little, in the short time we have, what I'd recommend coming as a physician and former member of parliament, uh, a little bit of a to-do list of what we can take home and actually work on. First, you've got to inform s different sectors, and that includes government. And I would caution simply speaking to ministries of health, you've got to speak to ministries of finance. That's where the power lies at the cabinet table. And I would also go to the offices of presidents and prime ministers. You've got to develop uh, a cohesive, uh, somewhat united front at the government table to support this. Bring our association on board. Look at other sectors, uh, including the private sector and groups within that that have a stake in the game, like health insurance. Uh, groups and of course health authorities. We've got to have clear asks in training across our associations not only as physicians but nurses, community health workers and others. Capacity building in health systems is critical and I would encourage you to look at our uh, website cugh.org where we'll have a new capacity building site any of you can use to help to build and help to train individuals around the world particularly in low-income countries where the impact of sepsis is felt the greatest. Funding and policies need to be established, defined, and have be clearly articulated. And importantly, we have to show the value proposition, not only in lives lost, but also in economic gain. And I would argue, and I think all of you know this, of course, is that if you strengthen our ability and our capacity to address sepsis, you also strengthen the health system more broadly. Finally, we have to mobilize our allies our professional associations, the private sector, public, public importantly, and government, and we need to communicate. I would argue we don't do the best job of communicating in our, in, as scientists and perhaps medical professionals, but we've got to tell stories. And the World Health, um, uh, so the Global Sepsis Alliance does a fabulous job of putting these stories online. Please use them, mobilize them, identify stories within your, within your communities and countries, share those with political leaders, and mobilize the public. Together, by doing this, I think we can come together a year from now and see a significant reduction in the number of people who are perishing from sepsis. Back to you, and thank you for allowing me to be here with you today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin. So, back to you, Ron. 
Thanks. So I'd now like to introduce, and it's my pleasure, um, Joao Breda, who um, uh, is part of the WHO office in Europe. And uh, looking online about you, Joao, you're a uh, public health physician also with a particular interest in preventative medicine, which is great to expand the field. Yes, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and congratulations really for the initiative. I would start maybe with some figures, it's commonplace to say, and probably I'm not the best positioned person to talk about data in this field, but if you want to sell a compelling story to policymakers, which seems to me that's a lot what you're doing here, one should remind ourselves that sepsis is eventually involved in around 20% of all global, all global debts. And this has a very interesting political impact because then you can relate it with the Sustainable Development Goals and eventually beyond the Sustainable Development Goal related with health, which as you know is number three, but there are also others. Clearly we know there's an issue of inequalities here, uh, the impact on people of the problem and people with lower income is clear. So there's really a political story, I think, to tell here. And, and of course, you link it with the WHO strong priorities around UHC vaccination, IPC, and so on and so forth. So we have a nice history in the last, let's say, five to six years in the context of the World Health Organization globally, but also in Europe. And I will tell you, my colleagues know better the global history, but I know what we've been trying to do in the European context. And there's also, I mean, there's a nice progress from the B to the resolutions to the Global Patient Safety Action Plan. There is a movement there, which is perhaps, apparently you would say it's, it's bureaucracy and ministers in the room and so on. But that mandate and that impact to the member states is really, really very important. And clearly the Global Action Plan on Patient Safety talks about talks about avoiding healthcare associated SEPs as well. So the data is there, it affects more the most vulnerable. It, it, it's a problem that is enshrined in the health systems and in the facilities and therefore we have an obligation to do it. It's related with quality of care and is related with performance and waste. A lot of them, we waste a lot of money in the health systems we know. Wherever you are, uh, richer and poorer countries. And a lot could be done if we increase quality and also by doing that, we also address the issues of, of sepsis. So I would like to bring here a perspective on quality of care because we have this new initiative based in Greece, which is a pan-European initiative supported by the government of Greece. It's a part of the WHO Regional Office for Europe. It's really to support member states, country level, support working with countries to address these issues of quality, including patient safety and, of course, sepsis as well, but looking at innovations. We believe that this is an area where, for example, the use of artificial intelligence and the innovations, harnessing the power of digital, but also social innovations in this area, they are very, very important. Otherwise, we continue to talk among a small group of people and among health professions only. So I think we have a great opportunity here to go beyond. What I can promise from our office, which is pan-European, is for all countries, rich and poor in the WHO European region, 53 member states, we will be focused on novel ways of addressing these issues and very much focus on innovation, of course, without forgetting a lot of work that needs to be done in countries. And therefore, as I, as I finish, you can count on WHO Europe really to try to look at the cutting edge elements which could, we could, in a way, bring um, to the uh, availability of our member states, but at the same time, country support and work at the level of on the ground health systems and facilities, which is really, really very important. And of course, working together. It's commonplace to say across sectors, but when, when you look at the health system, sometimes 
we don't really communicate that well among different groups and that can be done, I would say, better to prevent because it's about, of course, to address the issue, but there's a lot to be prevented and it's one of the areas, I, one of the things I've learned since I started to read about these topics. So thank you very much. Of course, we need to look at health, just the last point, in an holistic fashion. And we know that those were, that are, are, have healthier behaviors, that where we also use health promotion, these are less susceptible to sepsis and to have a very serious, um, let's say, outcome. So it's very important that we also, that we take it in a comprehensive way, an holistic way, from prevention health promotion to the most curative and really uh, addressing the, the, the project uh, in a comprehensive way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joao. And just reflecting on what you've just said, you know, of course health promotion is really important, but we all understand it's difficult for government, governments with a short cycle of office to deliver on that. But, so we need to push it as uh, professionals and activists. Okay, so going back to Zoom, the second uh, presenter actually you have in your uh, documents uh, Dr. Yannick Diaz, but uh, she couldn't make it for uh, some urgent uh, work. So her colleague, uh, I believe Dr. Vanessa Coromond, is going to be presenting. She works in the Health Emergency Promoting Unit in the WHO, and previously she worked. She used to work in the Emergency Medical Coord as an Emergency Medical Coordinator in MSF. So, uh, Dr. Coromond. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, colleagues, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak today. And apologies, I'm not Janet, but I will uh, do my best in the next couple of minutes to, to pass on her thoughts and reflections on this really important uh, topic. Um, so we were asked to reflect on the lessons learned from the pandemic to fight non-COVID sepsis. Um, and I'll take these next two minutes to try and do that justice. As we've seen uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and in previous outbreaks, sepsis is a common pathway to morbidity and mortality from these pathogens, meaning that sepsis not just in bacterial infections, but also in viral infections. Thus, it's imperative to introduce sepsis clinical care pathways that are able to integrate care of emerging infectious diseases in a safe and quality manner. So what does that mean for us? One is getting the right differential diagnosis up front and that access, access to fast and reliable diagnostics to, to diagnose early. This will allow for appropriate transmission-based IPC precautions to be put in place immediately to ensure safe healthcare settings for both patients and health workers and that the correct specific treatments can be initiated. Number two, uh, provide optimised supportive care interventions as appropriate for the clinical phenotype of the disease. We think this is really key to understand the clinical presentation of Ebola virus disease, which leads to significant dehydration alongside septic shock with multi-organ failure, has a window early where sufficient fluid resuscitation can improve outcomes dramatically. Whereas encounter by COVID-19 acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and thrombosis are the major clinical presentations and where fluid management is more cautious but oxygen delivery and safe use of non-invasive and invasive ventilation is the hallmark of clinical management. Reflecting on monkeypox where mortality indeed at the moment is very very low but there is emerging evidence that acute brain dysfunction with viral encephalitis requires specific supportive therapies for delirium and coma. Number three, provision of appropriate disease-specific therape therapeutics up front and early. This has been a significant curve for all of us. This is key in these emerging infectious diseases. They don't need antibiotics, but rather appropriate use of antivirals for COVID-19 um, and for monoclonal antibodies for Ebola virus disease. And we both see the benefit here early on in disease, so recognition being crucial. What we've also learned in COVID-19 is immunomodulation is key for severe and critical COVID-19 and perhaps that may be applied to other causes of viral sepsis and, and worth exploring further. The lattice brings us to access to key life-saving tools. Vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics are necessary to combat sepsis from all causes, including emerging infectious diseases. And that's just the point I wanted to, to, to end on. Um, so with that, I hand back to the chair and thanks very much for having us um, Thank you again and have a successful rest of the day. Thank you very much. And uh, Ron, back to you. 
Thanks so much. So I, just before I introduce Terry, I'd like to say now is the time to start formulating your questions because it's going to be over to you in three short minutes. Otherwise, you're subject to the questions that Abdulella and I want to ask. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Terry Reynolds, who's um, in the Department for the Management. Seems a huge portfolio of communicable disease, violence and injury prevention with the WHO. Um, and also a public health physician by background. So thank you, Terry. Thanks, and just to say, since my boss is sitting two chairs down, I'm actually now in the Department of Integrated Health Services, um, where I lead the unit on clinical services and systems. Um, so I have you at the end of the long stretch of the tired period right after lunch, and you've already been told to think about questions, so that's just perfect. Um, I was asked to talk about management. The other bummer is that prevention is better. So let me be very, very clear, prevention is better. Um, however, we really need to think about this as a spectrum. When you treat local infection, you prevent sepsis. When you treat sepsis, you prevent severe sepsis and shock. When you treat severe sepsis and shock, and anything that leads to it, you prevent disability and death. And that is really, finally, our goal. So we need to think very strongly about management action as a mechanism for prevention. Um, and then there's really four things I'd like to say to you in terms of the question I was asked, which was how do we most effectively execute the mandate of the resolution? So I think it really comes down to four things, and I'll give you an example of how WHO is doing each of these. One of them is make your problem a solution. The second one is be of use and then make yourself useless. The third one is to make things and count things. And the fourth one is to share a story, um, which this group actually is quite extraordinary at. So what I mean by that is if you're talking to someone and you can convince them that sepsis is a huge problem, which this organization has been also quite extraordinary at, then that's great. Then the message is these numbers, like we've heard today, they're extraordinary, they're unacceptable. The solutions are known, they're available and affordable. That's the message in that case. However, if you can't win someone over, for every minister you talk to, for every minister of finance or health or policymaker, they've had 10 other appointments that morning with someone wanting them to address their problem. So if you can't, you don't have to win over hearts and minds to your problem to succeed. You only have to win over hearts and minds to your solution to succeed. And what I mean by that is we do a lot of work at WHO oriented to, for example, strengthening the emergency care system which is a group of interventions that we in our minds target quite directly to sepsis. But they also happen to deliver against injury, against maternal health, against 10 SDD targets directly. So you can sell a solution rather than a problem. So you know what the solutions to sepsis are. The question is how do you sell that solution when you can't sell your problem? So that's a key thing. The other is be of use for the problem at hand. What I mean by that is we have a series of evolving master narratives. One decade, it's about the health system building blocks. Another decade, it is about universal health coverage. The last couple of years, the master narrative has very much been COVID. Again, the solutions that you know work need to be linked to those master narratives. I'll give you one example of that. Many countries, you need to be of use for the problem they are trying to solve. Many countries are developing national packages of essential health services. Those packages will drive most of the health policy in that country. The human resource decisions, the supply chain decisions, the foundations for health worker competencies. So what we've done at WHO is created a structured set of services that we recommend to countries to include in their essential health service packages and all of the elements that can be executed through the health system for sepsis prevention, care and rehabilitation are included. And those can be extracted as sepsis or they appear simply in the general list of priority services. So that has been a huge thing to specify these sepsis services as part of countries' essential health service packages. Then to make yourself useless, of course, what we're talking about is training. I just want to fly, flag a couple of things for you that we have coming up that we're really doing in celebration of this 10th World Sepsis Day. One is that next month we will pilot for the first time our WHO sepsis course, which brings together resources and a learning lab across the spectrum of prevention and care. 
And then the next one is our WHO critical care course will launch at the pilot phase in December, and those will be regional pilots. And so we really look forward to making those courses better together with you and working with you to disseminate them once we get them where they, where they need to be. Um, what I mean by make things and count things is that almost every one of the individual stories that we've heard today is about the failure of individual provider judgment. There are a lot of people in this room who are doctors and we have more than our share of arrogance um, and we overestimate our ability as individual providers. The goal needs to be putting in place tools and processes such that when we fail as humans, which is inevitable, that we don't kill other people. So we do at WHO a number of tools that are checklist for the early recognition of conditions like sepsis, that are triage tools that categorize people systematically when our own individual provider judgment fails. Um, and these processes, they, we have a registry platform that is aimed, and we're developing a dedicated sepsis module now, that is aimed at looking back at what we've done, where we've succeeded, where we failed, and instituting that within an emergency quality improvement program. Those are some of the make things and count things. And then finally, I just want to mention, share a story. People have said today multiple times, make it personal. And um, I think Global Sepsis Alliance has really been more effective at that than almost any other organization I've seen in bringing a face to the story. The other way that we need to think about what that means, share a story and make it personal, is we need to think in terms of pathways. So what we need, countries need to be developing pathway, optimal pathways of care, the choices that you make about how you organize services and where you put resources, those inherently create a pathway in a health system that is a channel of least resistance. And people in general will flow through that pathway. And so we need to be thinking that is another way of creating a story. It's quite technical, but you create a pathway. And that is how we need to approach sepsis because people do not get their needs met in one point of the health system. They need to move successfully across the health system. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Terry. And we need to have a hard stop on questions at 20 past so we can rearrange the stage here. So do we have questions from the floor, please? Uh, Mariam has a microphone. So whilst you're formulating your questions, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on what you just said, Terry, the, the power of storytelling, because we're conscious that there will be lots of people online who think, well, yes, Joel, we absolutely agree, but we have no clue how to get to a minister but do not underestimate the power of storytelling. It's how we started in the UK. It's a key part of what the Global Sepsis Alliance uh, does, but also, of course, you've heard Kieran's story. So don't underestimate it. If you make enough noise, you will achieve results. Questions, please. If you just... I don't have, uh, I have a clarification for the something that many people mentioned here. Uh, I think all the number of the deaths due to the COVID, they die by sepsis. And this is exactly uh, compatible with the definition that we have for the implicit sepsis. There is infectious, there is organ failure, then die by sepsis. If we do not find exactly, I see the code that it is related to the sepsis as an explicit. I think that this have to consider for the future. For example, now we have 13 million deaths due to the sepsis. If we add number of the deaths due to the COVID, it will be more than 16 million deaths. And this is very important that shows to be ready for the control of the sepsis in the infectious diseases, regardless that it is implicit or explicit. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone like to comment from the perspective of WHO on the link between COVID-19 and sepsis and whether they should be counted together? Just a quick comment on that because I think it's an important general principle for sepsis. You guys have all seen from a couple of presentations today how hard it is to count 
the burden of sepsis because in some ways it is a common end pathway for a lot of infections. So of course it needs to be recognized in that way. It's the reason it matters to count sepsis that way is because there are solutions that you can group and target to sepsis. So we were always told, you know, you say cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest. That is completely unhelpful. Eventually, all of us will stop breathing and our hearts stop beating, and that is the definition of death. So that's not helpful because there is no set of solutions where you can address cardiopulmonary arrest in that way. There are subsets you can address, whereas with sepsis, it is very helpful to group the numbers, that is a true statement, that these number of people died of this condition that can be addressed with a common set of, of interventions. And so that's what I think we should use as a criteria for judging when things should be grouped and not. If there is a common set of solutions that can be targeted at them, um, then it makes a lot of sense and it is true and it is effective advocacy to bring things together like that. Thank you. And very briefly, as an intensive care specialist, I would fully agree that certainly in high-income countries when people died with COVID-19, sepsis was the mode of death. But please, you had a response. I think maybe I said not correct. I am talking about deaths. And I know that cardiopulmonary deaths and sepsis are not underlying cause, are the intermediate cause. I am saying that in the every people that die with the underlying cause is COVID, sepsis was the intermediate. Then we have to be ready for the any other pandemic, not just control the pandemic, control the process that happened with the sepsis. Then we have to be ready. Thank you. Please. Two gentlemen in front. Yes, thank you. I would just briefly like to comment. I'm also an intensivist by training in, uh, in a large intensive care unit in this country, but I'm CEO of a company that just develops products um, in the complement space to um, treat sepsis. And if we don't uh, clearly state that patients that die of COVID-19 die in sepsis, we make, in my view, a big mistake because we all thought that this is the inflammatory response driving the disease. And, and there's, other than in some other areas that we classify as sepsis, hardly an area where it's so clean as in COVID-19. We have a dramatic inflammatory immune response. We have probably the highest complement system activation we've ever seen in any disease, which is our innate response to infection. So in COVID, we have the proof that our immune system drives this damage. So you have complement activation products that when you induce them in, in animals, they die. So I do think there's a very good reason and also a clear cause to say once patients have progressed to the critical stage, this is viral sepsis driving the disease. Um, I think we would miss an opportunity if we don't make that very clear. Great. And please, they, yeah. Well, well, I'm one of the advisors for COVID policy here in Germany, but also in Austria and in the United Kingdom. And I would say we should be honest. No question about there are COVID cases which show secondary infection, mainly bacterial or fungal. There are COVID patients which are from the beginning on <clears throat> in multi-organ failure and the pathophysiology is very similar to those what we see in sepsis. But on the other hand side, there's only one organ failure in COVID-19. So a lot of patients only suffer from acute respiratory failure and uh, show pulmonary involvement only over the time, what is one of the reasons why we use lung transplantation in COVID patients. So I think, yes, we should say sepsis can be a complication and can be a cause of COVID-19 disease as it is for other viral diseases too. It's the same for, for flu, but, but it's not that all COVID patients end up with sepsis. I think that's fair uh, to point it out. Yes, and, and I think we could move the debate on from COVID. Um, UK data showed that of people in intensive care during the first wave, 95% also had shock and 28% also had acute kidney injury, which I would suggest was sepsis. I don't know whether, Evangelos, you'd like to comment following your publication 
on the data? Is he here? No. Well, maybe uh, since we have two WHO people here on the stage, uh, the, the, the title of the, uh, the, uh, this, this session is um, uh, boosting the implementation of resolution. You know, we, we've had how many, maybe 75 assemblies, and so we're talking about hundreds of, of resolutions, and, and you know, you've got a very, very nice document that people feel very proud of producing, but then, uh, you know, we fail short when it comes to implementation. So, you know, my question to my colleagues at the WHO and to us, you know, as, a, as, as we're focused on, on, on sepsis, uh, why didn't that very, you know, beautifully written resolution actually uh, deliver more? You know, I'm not saying that it did not deliver, but why, why didn't it deliver more and how can we make sure that moving forward, we're not just focused on the wordsmithing of the, the resolutions, but then on writing them on a way of, you know, on, a, on an implementation bias. Otherwise, we would just continue to uh, repeating the same thing over and over again. Yeah, let me attempt to uh, answer that. Um, it is quite a difficult question. The, the issue is that WHO is a member state-driven organization. So we actually act as a secretariat for the member states, and the resolution is an articulation of member states' will. So as such, uh, WHO can, of course, prioritize and does prioritize the resolutions that are made, but it is up to the member states to also step up to actually implement that. WHO is not an implementer, just to be clear about it. It is member states that implement so, of course, uh, especially in resource-poor uh, uh, settings, uh, governments look at WHO to guide them in terms of priorities, and this is where we can do better also in sepsis. But I think in many cases, an initiative like we see here in Germany, where actually sepsis gets put on the political agenda, that actually is beneficial to WHO in driving the priority. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, just to be clear, I'm not putting the, the, you know, the, the weight on the shoulders of the WHO. It's, I think it's, it's every, every, every stakeholder involved. But, but again, it's, uh, you would agree with me that resolutions overall have not, you know, the majority of them did not deliver as one would have hoped for. And I, I think we should take this moment to celebrate the launching of the Swiss and the Austrian National Sepsis Action Plans this week. Um, and, I think it's more important that individual governments really examine what they can do. Um, sure. Can I give maybe a regional perspective? So, because you know we have the global WHO headquarters and then you have all the regions and we work in the European region and we are lucky enough to be closer to the, to the member states and, and closer to the ground. Of course we are more uh, guidance and, and um, in terms of Implementation, this is not the main drive of the organization, also in the European region. But one has to realize that resolutions and global action plans or strategies, they're there to motivate, they're there to inspire. One cannot expect that without action on the ground by the stakeholders and member states, this is not going to happen. So the fact that we have I mean, we just came from one week, the Regional Committee of Europe, where all the 53 member states were together discussing until midnight and all these resolutions and so on. And then after a while, you go back and you see that some of these might not have been implemented. They depend, making it a success depends on all of us. And there are some of these action plans and so on that really worked well on the ground. So it's also about benchmark from other areas, maybe more public health, maybe more other, other aspects where there's been success in implementing. And I think common point is that there is really um, that document or the plan brings something new and an extra motivation to the member states and the stakeholders to take action. So this is really a bit the problem is that we sometimes, because we have one of these documents, we believe it's enough. It's not. A lot of work on the ground, at the local level, with the support of WHO, of course, but we are just a small player here.
And I think we have two more comments, one from the from our colleague in Zoom and one from, uh, from here as well. So, so go ahead, Keith, and then we'll, we'll finish here. No, thanks. I, w I would just go back to Dr. Reynolds' comment, who I think powerfully articulated a very practical set of solutions. A couple of the really important points I'd like to emphasize, if I may, is that there are action packages. And we live in a, we live in a, we live in a sea of resolutions that international meetings have, but they don't have generally speaking, traction at a domestic level. It's up to us within countries to be able to make it a political priority. Be an ally. Fit what, identify the gaps. Work with governments at different levels. It doesn't always have to be national. You can work at, at, at provincial or even local health authorities to actually make a difference. So at different levels across countries, within countries, is where we can be allies. And as medical professionals, working not only as physicians, but with nurses and other groups, we need to work together to be able to work with different sectors, to work with them as allies, to functionally implement what we already know can reduce the, uh, the incidence of sepsis. And finally, look at this as we identified, it's part of a, of a system that we can reform with many, many downstream impacts, not only on lives saved, disability reduced, but also economic gains. So there's a lot of allies we can bring to the table, but it requires leadership. And we need to be able to play that role and assert that leadership at different levels within our countries. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Dr. Reynolds? Just a couple of really quick things on resolutions. One is that they are necessary but not sufficient. Um, two, we should never underestimate the power they have for champions within countries who have been tirelessly um, working for certain agendas. And it allows them, it gives them a megaphone and it amplifies their efforts and it gets their own national leadership to listen to them in some cases. Um, so that particular power of resolutions is often not seen. Um, and then the other thing is they need to be cross-mapped. So we, I recognize, so I don't know that I would totally agree that, the res that it's clear that the resolution has not progressed as we would have hoped, you know, and maybe that's just my, where I'm sitting in the world. But for example, we have a very concrete rollout of an emergency care toolkit that is all of the structured approaches that are evidence-based for sepsis, checklists, triage tools, um, management protocols, and then QI cycles to identify gaps in care and mitigate those gaps in care. Most of the countries who have executed that for a series of political reasons have done so under a different resolution, 7216. Other countries have done things under 6815, which is a resolution about surgery. So one of the powerful communication tools may be a cross-mapping of resolutions to action toolkits, because ministers would love, however important or unimportant we may think resolutions are, ministers love to tick that box and say, I am doing these five activities, and by doing those, I am delivering against these four resolutions and these 10 SDG targets. So if you can provide a minister a roadmap like that, that is very strong argument for the actions that you want taken. Thank you very much, Ron. So um, I think we, we need to bring this session to a close. And if I may, there's sort of two take homes I've heard. Are firstly, the need for leadership, Keith, thank you. And that was reinforced in an earlier session. And secondly, um, Dr. Hanan's closing comments, which uh, were kindly read by, uh, by Dr. Eggers, um, which were that we need to strengthen our resolve and take action, I paraphrase, on infection prevention, sepsis, AMR, and pandemic preparedness. And again, I paraphrase, we would consider these as the four pillars of infection management, and at a policy level, they need to be considered together. So I'd like to thank our panelists from the WHO very much, and uh, Abdelella and I will close session three. Thank you. Thank you very much.